create what you want. You have the power in you to do the more than you can ever begin to imagine, to control your destiny, to make a difference in our children, to make a difference on the planet, to make an impact. Let us say together, it's me. And let us say together, it's hard. Say it like you know it. Say it's hard. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard. There are people who have seen their retirements taken away from them by the corporations that they work for. They were within two or three years of retiring and they had it taken from them. The number one entrepreneurs in this country now are senior citizens. The number one employer, number two, McDonald's and Walmart. And there's nothing wrong with those jobs. I guarantee you those people did not have a plan to end up living their lives at the end of life with those types of jobs. And they didn't have a plan like you have and while you're investing in yourself not to. And it's hard. There are people making choices between purchasing prescription drugs or paying for gas or a mortgage note. It's hard when you're working on a job for 20 years, 30 years, give them some good years, and then they come in and tell you, we've downsized. In other ways, other words, you have fired. And then you have to start all over again. How many of you know it's hard? Raise your hands, please. It's hard. And it's not fair. One of the things I like about T. Harv is he talks about work and investing in yourself. It's not fair when people are going up against that kind of stuff to tell them just think positive and be enthusiastic and everything will work out all right. Ain't that kind of party. It's hard. Life will put some knots on your head. I bought my first home for my mother. I was rushing, didn't know what I was doing, and I bought a home that had a lien against it. And... They called me, Mr. Brown, yes, as a lien against your property. We need $55,000 if you're going to stay there. Wait a minute, sir. I just bought this home. The guy told me there were no liens against it. I'm not the one that owe you the money. You should have checked that out, Mr. Brown. Come on. I called my attorney. We follow up. Yes, Les, there's a lien against the property. But he told me there were no liens. He lied, obviously. Oh, my God. He told me he wanted to help me because he admired the fact that I was buying this home for my mother and that he was adopted and he, he identified with me. Les, he suckered you. He played you, man. So what, well, would they take payment arrangements? Can I, what about $5,000 a month? They want all the money, Les. They want all the money or you're going to have to get out. The house is going up for sheriff sale. Do you have it? No, I... I don't have them. Can they give me some time? Tell them to give me, give me three months, please. Give me three months. I, my mother's in her 70s, man. She has a bad heart. Don't do this to me. This is my dream. Don't do this, man. Please, t let me talk to them. Les, I'm talking to their attorney. They don't want to talk to you. I've got to talk to their attorneys. Do you have the money? No. Will they give me three months? No. What about two months? No, Les. They want the money in seven days. <sighs> Oh my God, uh, let me call you back, I'm not sure. And I walked the floors thinking, God, how could this happen to me? I've got to figure this out, huh? I've got to figure this out. It seemed like the days were just ticking off, ticking off. Thursday, I had to call them and let them know. They called me, Les, do you have the money? No, I don't. Friday, you have to leave. The sheriff will be there. You're going to have to leave, Les. They're going to take my house. What about my down payment? You lost it, Les. You lost it. Okay. I got to go. Yes. I prayed, Lord, please. If you show me that you're real. If, if, it's, if you're really real, you think Paul worked for you. You've, you haven't seen anything. Don't let me lose this house and watch what I'll do for you. I was trying to cut a deal. <laughs> Have you ever tried to cut a deal? <laughs> it's amazing how spiritual you get when you get in trouble, you know what I mean? When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was going to bed with the, with the Bible and the Holy Quran and 
science of mind and Joel Goldsmith, everything I could find. I was praying to Jesus, Yahweh, Melchizedek, everybody. I was calling on everybody. It's amazing. And, and here I was walking the floor at 3 o'clock in the morning and I had to go and wake my mother up. I got on my knees and I said, Mama, I said, I need you to wake up. She said, what's wrong, Leslie? I can, I can hear you walking back and forth. I'm not asleep, son. I said, there's something I need to tell you. She said, your eyes are red. Why are your eyes red? Because I feel so stupid now. Why? We got to move tomorrow. Why, Leslie? There's a lien against the property and they want $55,000 and I don't have it. And we're going to be set out tomorrow. We have to go back to Liberty City. So she said, it's okay. I don't like this house anyhow. I said, why? She said, because of my arthritic knees. It, helps, it hurts my knees when I go up the steps. I said, then why didn't you tell me? Because you were so happy. I just said it because you were happy. I'll live in a shack with you, boy. I love you. It's not the house. I love you. I love all my children. I said, thank you, Mama. Thank you. The next day, the next day when we were in the truck going back to Liberty City and we pulled down 68th Terrace, the neighbors came out and said, Wow, Mamie, Mamie, y'all coming back? Are you back? Yes. What happened to the home your boy bought for you? Those boys you adopted. Leslie didn't do a title search. He made a mistake. And boy, I was, I was so humiliated. How many ever made a mistake that you were just humiliated? Raise your hands. I was devastated. I was taking the furniture off the truck. And my mother came and I was crying. And she said, boy, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, hold your head up. I said, mama, I can't. She said, hold your head up. I said, why? Look what I've done. She said, it's OK. It's okay, you are going to make a lot of mistakes in life, young man. You're going to fail your way to success. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Keep your head up and take that furniture back in the house. I said, yes, ma'am. And I learned something from that. If you ever go through something, hold your head up. If you ever make a mistake, hold your head up. If you ever do something and everything goes wrong, life catch you on the blind side, hold your head up. It's not over. Goethe says, that which does not kill you will make you stronger. Hold your head up. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, hold your head up. Here's something else, ladies and gentlemen. Repeat after me, please. You got to be hungry. Everybody together, you got to be hungry. I'll never forget Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. What do you want to do with your life, young man? I said, sir, I want to be a disc jockey. He said, Mr. Brown. I said, yes, sir. He said, you got to be hungry. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. People that are hungry are willing to invest in themselves. People that are hungry will go to seminars and workshops. People that are hungry are always searching, always seeking higher ground. So how do you want to make it? I said, I want to be a disc jockey. He says, good. Here's what to do. He said, I want you to read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. He said, you don't get in life what you want. You get in life what you are. You must program yourself to success. He said, I want you to listen to Earl Nightingale and Zig Ziglar. Listen, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. He said, I want you to change your relationships. And I don't want you to ever lose your hunger. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are hungry are unstoppable. People that are hungry are no matter what people. They make it happen no matter what. He said, I want you to listen to Paul Harvey. Who is he? He's the world's greatest communicator. Success leaves clues, young man. 
Always listen and follow people who are doing what it is you want to do at the level you want to do it and learn from them. I told T. Hobb when we were standing by the stage, I said, hey man, I want to work more with you. I want you to coach me. I want to learn from you. See, I found you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. Always have a thirst for learning. So I listened to Paul Harvey every day on the radio. While in school, I would go out and listen in his car. He gave me his keys. I was working to develop myself. And I continued to listen to motivational messages. And he would take me to see the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. I toured with him before he passed. You, you have something special. You have greatness within you. Don't allow your circumstances to determine who you are. Don't allow your negative thoughts to hold you back. You, you have something special. You can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Dr. Peel was an incredible man. I, I admired him when he spoke. He gave me goosebumps. I can feel him in my heart. And, and I never forget, we were coming back to the school and Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. When Dr. Peel spoke, you didn't move. When he spoke, you were hanging on every word. When he spoke, we didn't have to tell you to sit down and be quiet. Why? I said, sir, I could, I could feel him when he talked. I felt like he was talking to me, sir. He said, he was. I said, but he doesn't know me, but he was speaking to you. Did you feel him in your heart? I said, yes, sir. He said, most people feel him in their head. If you felt him in your heart, he said, listen to him, son. Follow him. Learn from him. And I would go to seminars and workshops. Anywhere I would find where Dr. Peel was, I would be in the audience. I would drive two and three hundred miles just to hear him speak. And my dream and vision was, was to share the stage with him. I thought about it. What is your goal? What is your vision? I want you to hold it in mind. There's some power in that. Because... When I became involved in speaking, i never forget, I got a call from Og Mandino, who wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. He said, Lass, I'm stuck in Philadelphia. I need to be in Kankakee. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is appearing. I can't make it. I heard you're in Chicago. I said, yes, I am. Can you go and open for me? I said, yes, man. Oh, my God. Dr. Peale, I said, yes, I'd love to do it. And I went there, and I came. I said, hi, I'm... I'm Les Brown. He said, you're not the band of renown? I said, no, I'm, I'm Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. I'm here to speak. He said, come backstage. And his wife, Martha, was there. And she said, Papa, Les Brown is here, the speaker. And he said, Les Brown? Les Brown, shoot for the moon? Because even if you miss your land among the stars? I said, sir, that's my quote. I wrote you when I was in the 11th grade. I was a part of a special, special education class project. That's my quote. He said, I know. I end all my speeches with that quote. And Dr. Peel had a great sense of humor. A young man was backstage, and I had so many questions to ask him, and my mind froze up, and the young guy said, Dr. Peel, how old are you? And he was up in age. He said, Sonny, I'm, I'm 92. Young man looked at him and said, I don't know if I want to live to get 92. He said, that's because you've never been 91. <laughs> so I did the things that Mr. Washington suggested. I listened to motivational tapes on a regular basis. I would go to seminars and workshops whenever Zig Ziglar and Dr. Dennis Wigley and Jim Rowan would come to town. And I said, sir, I said, what do you want me to do now? He said, Mr. Brown, I've given you everything that I can give you. He said, develop your mind, put your money where your mouth is, continue to learn how to be an effective communicator, because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. And always surround yourself with OQP, only quality people. So I went to apply for a job on Miami Beach. WMBM radio station, Milton Butterball Smith was the program director. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I'd like to be a disc jockey. He said, young man, you have any journalism in your background? I said, no, sir, I don't. You have any experience in broadcasting? I said, no, sir, but I practice all the time, sir. Let me audition for you, sir. Let me show you how good I am. All I need is a shot, sir. He says, no, we don't have any job for you. How many have ever been rejected? Raise your hands, please. 
I was devastated. I went back and I told Mr. Washington, I said, Mr. Washington, they said no. He said, don't take it personally. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you got to be hungry. Make no your vitamin. Go back again. I said, yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. Young man, weren't you here yesterday? Yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? Yes, sir, you did. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I didn't know whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. Nobody was laid off or fired. Now, get on out of here. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? Yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? Yes, sir, you did. Why are you back? Oh, sir, I didn't, I didn't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off a fire. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day talking loud, looking happy like I was seeing him for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He says, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. My favorite book says, the greatest among you will be your servant. How many of you are serious about your goals and dreams? Raise your hands. Very good. Write this down. Provide more service than you get paid for. Provide more service than you get paid for. I go to a lot of seminars and workshops. And one of the things I know about T. Hart Eckert, and I was sitting in the class of Robert Rappel, and all of the other presenters, they hold themselves to high standards, and they provide more information than anybody else in the industry, bar none. They hold nothing back because their commitment is for your success. And when you hold yourself to high standards, write this down, impact drives income. That's why you're here. Because the training, the seminars, been making a difference in your life. If they did not have impact, two or three hundred people would be here, if that amount. Impact drives income. So I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I would go get their lunch and their dinner, and I would bring it to them in the control room, and I'd watch them working the control boards, knowing my time will come. Write this down. I expect to reach my goal. Yes, you want to operate with a spirit of expectation. I expect to reach my goal. So I started preparing for the next position. Never forget one quote that I heard. As you look at your life, look at your goals and dreams. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. If you expect to reach your goal, prepare yourself now. And so then pretty soon, the guys at the station, they begin to take a liking to me. Write this down. Build relationships. As you're aware, people deal with people that they know, like, and trust. And so they would say, Leslie, yes, sir. Come here, yes. Come out of sight. Who did this? Oh, your car? Yes. Who cleaned my car? I did, sir. I would wax their cars on the weekend, inside and out. How much do you charge? Oh, nothing, sir. I just wanted to help out. I was providing more service than I got paid for. I was building relationships. I said, whoa, look here. Donna Ross and the Supremes are coming to town. The Four Tops and the Temptations. Here, here are my car keys. Pick them up for me. Take them to the Fountain Blue Hotel on Miami Beach. I said, yes, sir. I would drive them all over Miami Beach in the big, long Cadillacs. I didn't have any driver's license, but I was driving like I had some. <laughs> then one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was the only one there. Rockin' Roger got so drunk, he could not complete the show. He started slurring his words. He's about to fall off the chair. And there I was, looking at him through the control room window, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink, rock. I'd have gone and get him some more if he'd asked me to. 
Then pretty soon the phone rang. It was the general manager, and I answered the phone. I said, hello? He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I said to myself, he must be thinking I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra, I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn up the radio. I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes, and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go on there and segue the records, but don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get old Rock out of the way. I put on a fast record. I said, look out, this is me, LD Triple T. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single, love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and doubly qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. I was hungry. Get old man a round of applause. I was hungry. I was hungry. You gotta be hungry. Shake the one's hand on your right and left all around you and say, you got to be hungry. You got to be hungry. To get those dreams out of your head and step into your greatness, you got to be hungry. To get those ideas, that talent, that gift out of your system, you got to be hungry. To get up off the canvas of life, and understand what Willie Jolly meant that a setback is a setup for a comeback. You got to be hungry. People that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. How many of you got value out of what you've heard thus far? Raise your hands, please. Very good. I'd like to leave this with you. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know what you want to do. Here's what I know about you. You have greatness within you. Here's what I know about you. I can help you to live full and to die empty. I can show you what I've learned. If anybody told me that I would be doing what I'm doing now, I leave here today, I go to New Orleans and speak there, then I'll be flown to Barcelona. If anybody told me, given my circumstances, born in an abandoned building on a floor in a poor section of Miami, Florida, called Liberty City, of both my birth parents sit up and said, hello, son, I would not know either one being labeled educable mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade, fail again when I was in the eighth grade, no college training. Anybody told me the principles that I would teach you that they would have the impact that it has had on my life. This Les Brown that you see, I did not know he existed. And I tell you that you have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Come into the room with me. And I guarantee your life will never be the same again.